Alhamdulillah. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his household, his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them and every one of us to protect us from all forms of evil and harm, sickness, difficulty, and calamity. Ameen. And to grant goodness to our offspring, those to come up to the end, to keep them steadfast on the deen in a way that they can carry it to the generations that will follow right to the end. Amin. My brothers and sisters, we all know that nothing happens except by the decree of Allah. We all know that life and death is in the hands of Allah. We all know that sickness and health is in the hands of Allah. We all have full conviction in Allah. We believe in Him. We have seen so many pass away without being sick or ill. And we've seen those who've passed away with sickness and illness. Some pass away when they're very young and others when they're very old. My brothers and sisters, we have conviction. We are mu'mineen. We believe. You and I know that at the moment, the whole world is going through a nightmare. Something we cannot see with the naked eye, something that cannot be diagnosed almost instantly, something that does not show up in symptom form except after so many days. It is the sickness or the virus known as the COVID-19 or the coronavirus. And it's important for us not to panic. We are fortunate in Zimbabwe sitting in this particular masjid i can tell you that we have not had confirmed cases yet although they've been suspected cases and people have said things here and there not everyone with the flu is a carrier of the virus that having been said we're watching the globe from a single case to a few hundred to a few thousand in the matter of days we cannot be fools to just sit and watch and it does not negate our Iman in Allah. If anything, conviction in Allah and laying full trust in Allah would only be true if we took every possible precaution. If you did not take the precaution, you do not have trust in Allah. And I present evidence for that. The hadith, the Prophet ﷺ tells us about tying the camel and then laying the trust in Allah. True trust in Allah is never by leaving your doors open at night and saying tawakkal to Allah. That is a false sense of trust. It is known as tawakkul and not tawakkul. The hadith says, لَوْ أَنَّكُمْ تَتَوَكَّلُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ حَقَّ تَوَكُّلِهِ لَرَزَقَكُمْ كَمَا يَرْزُقُ الطَّيْرُ تَغْدُوا خِمَاصًا وَتَرُوحُ بِطَانًا If you were to lay the true trust in Allah, He would sustain you and provide for you in the same way that He provides for the bird. And the hadith doesn't stop there. It doesn't mean I say I lay my trust in Allah and then you sit at home and do nothing about it and say my Iman is strong. I'm reading whatever portion of the Quran. I'm doing so many adhkar. I'm reading a hundred thousand times this and that. All of that said, all you needed to do was go out and look for a job. Subhanallah. And then Allah would open your doors. You can't say I want to get married and you're hiding in the house. No one knows you even exist. So the hadith continues to say, the bird comes out of its nest in the morning and struggles whole day and comes back with a full belly. Which means it went out and made the effort all day. That's when Allah wrote its sustenance somewhere and it went and it got it. Subhanallah, Allah inspires you to go to a place where your sustenance is written. You know, when death is written for you, you will walk towards it. But if you did not take the precautions, you are responsible in the eyes of Allah. Remember this. So my brothers and sisters, we have a huge disaster because on one hand, we have people who are relatively pious, who are not marrying the medical information with the religious information. The religious knowledge that they have needs to be translated in the light of what is happening on the ground based on what the medical experts are telling you. So if the experts are letting you know that, you know what, there is a massive looming crisis, you'd better take heed. A country like this where, and I'm not proud to say this, where the health sector is probably suffering the most, one of the weakest in the world, although we may have some of the best doctors amongst us sitting right here in front of me. Still, that health sector and what it offers us, no one would like to get sick in a country like this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. So what do we do? We have people who are telling us on one hand, lay your trust in Allah completely. Don't worry. Don't do anything about it. If death is written for you, it will come for you. We ask them, why don't you leave your doors open at night? Why don't you leave your cars open and then say we are mu'mineen, we believe in Allah. If anything is going to happen, let it happen. Why don't you do that? They will say because you are taught to tie the camel. Well, the same camel applies here. Don't, uh, don't be a person of double and triple and quadruple standards. Care for everyone, not just for yourself. So it is a crisis. People are blackmailing us by telling us that it negates your iman to be worried about something and concerned. It does not negate your iman to be concerned and take precautions. Not at all. If we were to say, my brothers and sisters, bring your own musalla, sajjada, when you are coming to the masjid, so that there is no contamination. Wallahi, we are not giving you the wrong advice. If we were to tell you, wash up at home, use the toilet at home, make sure you come in, don't shake hands. We are not giving you the wrong advice. We are scholars. We are people who studied the deen. These are unprecedented times not known in living memory. Subhanallah. Unprecedented times. We have never ever come across this type of scenario. If we don't rise to the occasion, we will be failing humanity. And we, we should not be bothered about what those who don't see the light we've seen are saying. We need to still go on and present our opinions. I can let you know something very interesting. A few weeks ago, I was from one of those who was thinking, perhaps this is a big hoax. Perhaps this is just, you know, something and it's over exaggerated. I promise you, it took me just a little bit of travel, a little bit of research, a little bit of concern for the ummah to quickly change my mind to say, you know what, as a leader, you should never say those words. Luckily, I never said them in public. Subhanallah. And those who are saying today that don't ever do anything about it. Two weeks from now or a few weeks from now, they will cry tears of blood if they truly have the concern for humanity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. If we were to tell you, my brothers and sisters, keep a little bit of a distance between each other when you're talking. Even if people were to say, put on your mask, whether it helps or not from a medical perspective is something else. They would not be wrong. This is good advice for you. Remember, it is mainly the weak and the vulnerable whom we are concerned about. The older people, the young ones might ride the wave and come out of it because the percentage of death, they may argue, is very small. But who knows if you have an underlying condition, the chances are that you will be from among those who don't make it. And trust me, if you have 12 ICU beds in an entire country, you don't want to even begin to think of where you're going to go. If they tell you in Modern countries, first world countries that you know what we have to choose who we serve because have you been of service to humanity? Are you a person we need in the community? If yes, this is the bed for you. If not, go and die. May Allah forgive us. We don't want to ever see those days. So all I am saying today and this address is extremely important is brothers and sisters. Yes. There may be a conspiracy theory. It might have started by this person and that person. It might have been started for political or financial reasons. Whatever it may be, that's not my field. I have to look at what is on the ground today, no matter who started it. When the bushfire started in Australia, they could blame anyone. But it became a catastrophe for humanity, not just for Australia. Who started it and who didn't is a topic for those who, who enjoy that or who want to look into it. But as for you and I, what's of importance for us is to save lives, to ensure we don't give the wrong advice and we don't blackmail people using religion. How can you? So if authorities were to tell you, listen, you have to adopt the following, then my brothers and sisters, no matter what type of a conspiracy may be, wherever it might have come from, you have to take heed. People are not foolish. I sit and I look at those who worshipped money all their lives. In some countries, they have had to shut down their economies for a moment. Do you think they would really do that if it wasn't such a serious matter for them? That was their God. For us, we believe in Allah. Nobody is saying stop your salah, increase your salah, increase your tilawa, seek the forgiveness of Allah. Allah wants us to cry to him at a time like this. 
Allah wants us to turn to him. Allah wants us to be at pain. It is not a joke when Mecca and Medina have had to take such stringent measures. Subhanallah. I've been reading very, very deeply because it's a matter that concerns us and our congregations and the Muslim Ummah and humanity at large. We don't want to see our loved ones struggling simply because we were foolish in the manner we gave advice. We thought we were very pious. I want to take you to an incident that occurred with me in 1996. I was in Hajj and the fire was raging in Mina. And you know what? I heard the authorities, some of the policemen and the firemen saying, on their you know internal walkie-talkie system and whatever they had they were speaking to each other saying we have to evacuate the whole of mina within two hours because the fire is actually raging the gas canisters are exploding the wind is blowing very very hard in the wrong direction wrong meaning it's going to cause damage and so these people started with their loud hailers telling people to vacate i recall vividly something i'll never forget in my life a certain senior scholar from this part of the world was telling the brothers and sisters in the tents my brothers my sisters read ya surah yasin and nothing will happen to you wallahi you don't need to move the fire can never reach out to you because meaning can never reach you because you are hujjaj you're making dua to allah you're crying to allah and you're reading yasin how can the fire get to you Subhanallah. If you look at it from a religious perspective, that person did not really think what he was saying. Although he was a scholar, he didn't know with all the knowledge he had how to translate that knowledge, bearing in mind the re reality on the ground. When if a person were to be dying in hunger, the Quran says, فَمَنِ اضْطُرَّ فِي مَخْمَصَةٍ غَيْرَ مُتَجَانِفٍ لِإِثْمٍ If a person is really dying and they need to engage in or consume something totally prohibited, then they will not be to blame. Wow, subhanallah. Why? Because the prohibition of the death is far worse than the prohibition of or the prohibition of wasting a human life when you could have saved it is far worse than the prohibition of the pork or the swine may allah never let us see those days but trust me there will be scholars from us who will tell you die and don't eat it because they will find it too heavy in their hearts to ever let a day come when you have to consume that swine i don't blame them on one hand but on the other hand if it were to come they cannot issue their own feelings when there is a clear-cut evidence in the quran and the sunnah that you are allowed to do this to save your life and you should. So on one hand, it's painful to see Makkah and Medina turn away those who are coming for Umrah, possibly even for Hajj. May Allah let this matter resolve before Hajj. Say Amen. Amen. So my brothers and sisters, it is absolutely important for us to know it pains the heart, but we have to make crucial decisions, decisions that people will not like us for. They will hate us. They will think, what are you doing? Aren't you worshiping Allah? But we are worshiping Allah more, perhaps not exactly in the same place because of how this virus is spreading and what the experts have told us that same brother. I got up immediately after him and I took the loud hela and I said, my brothers and I was a young boy. My brothers, my sisters, there are people in the other tents who have read Yasin. They are also hujjaj. They were crying to Allah and they died and they were burnt to death after having read the Yasin. It does not mean that you're going to read it so automatically. Allah is going to save you. Allah is going to tell you, didn't I give you two legs for you to walk towards Makkah with while the fire was raging on? Many people understood it. They started packing their things and walking towards Makkah. You won't believe it. I remember helping some of the elder folks. And when I came out, I saw the same Alim who was talking in the tent. He was way ahead, all of us with a flag saying, brothers, let's go to Makkah. Let's go to Makkah. And I'm thinking, and like I said, I'll never forget it. It was only because of his love for Hajj and his love for Allah that he gave totally wrong advice. The next day when we came back, all the tents were burnt down. A few days later, in fact, we went to Arafah the next day, the following day when we came back, we were in ashes basically with makeshift facilities in Mina. Some of you who were there might remember this. 
The same is happening now. People are telling us, no need. Let's gather in bigger numbers. Let's go to the masjids. Let's pack it. You know, if Allah's written mouth for you, it's going to come and so on. Well, to be honest with you, why don't you give the children knives to play with them and tell them if Allah's written them for them to slice themselves, they will do and kill themselves. They will do. And if he's not written it, it won't happen because you know that it's your duty to keep the knives away the same way this virus is a knife. Don't let it spread to everyone and give it because they will be sliced and they will slice others. I am more worried as I walked in today. I met a few brothers. I said, brother, I'm not going to shake your hand and I'm going to keep a little bit of a distance. Who knows? I might be carrying it. You might be carrying it. And I don't want you to curse me tomorrow or vice versa. What was wrong in Islam? I don't have to shake your hand, but I have to save your life. I can wave at you from far. We don't believe in the elbow shake or the leg shake or all these shakes. Those shakes will shake us as in shaking. But when it comes to the greeting, you say Assalamu Alaikum by your tongue, by your mouth. And that's it. The shaking of the hand is another sunnah. You may do it under normal circumstances, but you can just wave from a distance if you'd like. And even if you don't want to wave, the fact that you said Assalamu Alaikum aloud, your duty has been fulfilled. So remember this, we have to say, we have to speak similarly in our country. The government has issued a directive. The president spoke whether we like it or not. He is in charge of the nation at the moment. Subhanallah. He says you shall not gather more than a hundred people. He knows what he's talking about. He definitely knows what he's talking about. Take a look at the other countries. Go and study. I studied South Korea patient number 31. That's what they say. Go and study what happened to that patient. They spread it from a church service. Do you really want people say that the Muslims spread it from the masjid? Imagine if Makkah and Medina had spread that virus throughout the globe, the world would not want to touch a Muslim. They would say these Muslims have spread the virus from their sacred places. Just as well at hindsight, it was closed. Although at the time that they did all the shutdowns, we were very, very pained, hurt. And we to this day, we are weeping. I personally had a trip planned with everything paid for and I've had to cancel it. So it's not like we didn't suffer financial loss, but at the same time, financial loss is nothing when it comes to saving life. My brothers, my sisters, this is a very, very important message. Many people are thinking one way or another. Some are excited to say the masjid will be closed. Nobody's excited. Today we're seated here. We're probably how many of us? I was counting after Salah and I said, Subhanallah, we're probably about 30, 40 maximum. And we were told not to gather more than a hundred for this reason in this masjid. And I'm speaking here about Masjid Al Falah in Harare, Zimbabwe, for the benefit of those who might listen to this later in other countries. We have decided that this masjid will remain open. You and I know that the numbers in this particular part don't get to the numbers of restriction except on Jum'ah and a Friday. So for every other Salah, the masjid will remain open. You are encouraged to make wudu at home and to come to the masjid. If you have symptoms of a flu or if you are unwell or if your immune system, you know it is weak, compromised, etc. Please read Salah at home. There's no problem. The Prophet ﷺ has given us that leeway and so has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, it would be prohibited knowing, prohibited knowing that you are unwell somehow or knowing that you're throwing yourself into destruction to actually come to a masjid. Allah says never ever throw your own self into destruction. That's the same evidence that prohibits suicide. Don't ever kill yourselves because Allah is so merciful. If you can't do it one way, do it another way. So my brothers and sisters, remember this. These are beautiful rules and regulations. If you're not well, don't come. If you're, if you're afraid of perhaps you might catch it or you might not. If you've traveled overseas and you've come back, practice self quarantine, perhaps stay, stay at home for at least five to six days. If there are any symptoms, then don't come into the public. And if you don't have symptoms, you may want to reintroduce yourself in a certain way. In some countries, they've, they've already gone into the lockdown phase. No one's allowed to move. In some countries, the places of worship are all closed. Here in this country, like I said at the beginning, we don't yet have a single confirmed case. But I promise you, the minute there is one, in a few days, there'll be hundreds. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So, like I said, Salah, the daily Salah, the masjid will remain open, inshallah. This particular masjid, because 
the regulations mention 100 people we will be less than 100 and uh, inshallah all the areas will be regularly sanitized and the musallis are uh, encouraged to observe wudu at home i want to add if you have your own musalla and you want to bring it bring it in case you or anyone else has contamination you will have gone down in sujood breathing that place of sujood where when you are there with your own musalla and sajjad so if you want to bring it bring it and inshallah you will be uh, perhaps doing yourself a favor similarly i am adding to this that the shaking of hands and so on it's not necessary you can talk to each other from a little bit of a distance and even when we are packing the sufuf we will pack them by the will of allah but it doesn't need to be so squashy as we usually do keep a small a small little you know a comfortable space for now we are okay this rule might change and if it does change and if we do have to shut down trust me i'll be the first one to announce it if need be because we have to take the lead but inshallah we don't get to that by the will of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so what about salatul jumu'ah in this masjid as you know there is more than one section we have this section we have the other section on that side there we have the classrooms and we have another section next door but we will use these as you know this particular room does not take more than a hundred perhaps a hundred maybe a little bit more we will restrict it to 100 there will not be more than 100 here as per the directive so there will be ushers at the doors inshallah they will usher the people in when there's 100 people a little bit less than 100 they will tell you separate entry separate entrance separate door everything is separate for the other section they will enter from there and the next 100 will be there if we do have more than that they will be in the classroom or in the madrasa it's in the madrasa which is the next door building so it's a totally separate building the jumu'ah will go ahead in this masjid there will only be one one jumu'ah and there will also be one salah as for the ladies the facility is exactly the same it will be open and they they will be less than a hundred by the will of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they will be ushers if not meaning if it overflows i don't think it will overflow we've actually been monitoring it quite closely of late and inshallah they won't have more than a hundred on that side so these are just some of the restrictions that have to be put in place and inshallah i pray that allah grant us cure like i say i hope that we don't have to make other announcements that other scholars have had to make in other countries and we have splits in the ummah based on whether i should save your life or not that's the split how on earth can i allow that to happen scholars of note senior scholars are actually making a huge mistake by not reading and marrying the knowledge that they have and they do have the knowledge but they're not marrying it with the medical expertise on the ground and what's going on i believe britain and these other big countries are taking stringent measures some of the most advanced countries in the world have already gone on lockdown may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us don't ever think that just because you worship allah you're not going to get sick don't ever think just because you worship Allah, you're okay. Your disease won't spread. That is actually foolish. If that was the case, none of us would ever need to move from our beds because if we were proper Muslims, Allah would have carried us to the masjid. That's what people would have believed. We have to take these precautions and we have to make sure we take them seriously. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of us. Like I say, I'm not telling you this to be frightened of it. If I was frightened, I wouldn't have been here tonight. But what I'm saying is, it's our duty as leaders to guide the people who look up to us, to tell them, listen, from a religious perspective, you must take every necessary step and even a little bit more to make sure that the Musallis and the Muslimin and the hum and human beings, humanity at large, are not affected just like that. And I want to repeat one last thing before I actually close. My brothers and sisters, in this country, you and I know what is the condition of the health sector. You know that. I know that. Make dua, we don't get ill and sick. You know, it is the last thing you would like. May Allah protect us all, take things seriously, go home and speak about it, spread it as far and wide as you can, and don't be shy not to shake hands. Get used to it. It took me getting used to not to shake hands. People look at you, they want to come and say, no, 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 wait, hold on. Teach them, say something. It's not necessary. I had, I had a scholar tell me, no, do you also believe in all this rubbish? I said, Sheikh, it's not rubbish. If we don't lead by example, what do you expect of the rest of the Ummah? 
May Allah protect us all and grant us really protection from this disease and all other sickness. May Allah grant cure to those who are sick and ill and rahmah to the marhumin. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilaha.